could never imagine when I did the first one that there would be ten more. <laughs> but that's what we've done, and we owe that to your uh, interest and your vigorous participation in the MPA program and the leadership program and RIAS. So thank you for all, for all of you for coming, and I need to thank um, Lee Koo. <laughs> There she is. Sorry, you all you all met Ms. Koo, right? She yeah. has replaced our own Mrs. Flora, who we thought irreplaceable. Uh, but Ms. Koo has done a fabulous job, and she's actually in charge. <coughs> and I'm here dressed as I am because she told me to wear this. <laughs> and I have a name tag because she made me put it on. <laughs> And if you've been around her, you know that she doesn't take no for an answer very easily. <laughs> uh, we are um, indebted to her for putting all this together. The logistics of these things aren't easy. Um, and this is the first of we uh, plan two more after this. So um, we're hopeful that um, the uh, planning goes as smoothly as it did. And I think we can count on Ms. Koo to do that. Dr. Norbell, of course, was a uh, key contributor here. Um, with the uh, important comment along the way, um, the under breath comment that sometimes I didn't want to hear, but nonetheless, she added humor and good sense to much of what we were doing this evening, and I want to thank her. Also, this is partly, uh, the event is partly sponsored by the Rhode Island chapter of the American Society for Public Administration, otherwise known as Rye ESPA. And RIASPA has been connected to this program since at least 2008. Um, and actually, the founding of the Rhode Island chapter goes all the, way, all the way back to the 90s, and then it sort of got lost in the midst of time. So we were lucky enough to restart it. And I think we've been exceptionally uh, successful in doing so. Uh, we put on um, how many, seven, eight will be in the spring? Eight mm -hmm. public service week mm -hmm. conferences, at which we've had um, the president and the vice president of National ASPA since 2008. Um, and they think that our chapter is pretty darn good. And Dr. Norvell has gone to Washington or been involved in a conference call for the mid year meeting of ASPA, uh, where we've gotten a favorite spot on the agenda. And I believe they called it How to Take Your Chapter to the Next Level. So if we are at that level, we owe it to the membership and to your participation. We thank you for that. And as a matter, as a matter of fact, RIASPA also has a board, and some of those board members are here with us tonight. And I would like to give recognition and thanks to them. We have Mrs. Vicki Walters. <laughs> and we have Ms. Chantel Bima. <laughs> we have Mr. Christopher Pierce. And we have Ms. Sasha Zapata. So they were elected and have been turned into the office uh, at national headquarters and are on the list of members and board members of National ASPA. I will also tell you that our chapter has been, uh, stands out uh, even if we are not at the next level, uh, but it is every year uh, ASPA sponsored what's called the ASPA Founders Fellow Program. And it usually goes to PhD students. In fact, it almost exclusively goes to uh, PhD students until about two years ago when a gentleman who was with us tonight walked into my office and said, I'd like to apply for the Ask the Fellows program. And I said, how'd you know about it? Because <laughs> we don't have a PhD. He said he went to, the, he, he's a member of ASPA, he joined, he looked up the Founders Program and he said, I'd like to apply and will you nominate me? I said, yes, I'd be happy to do that. So the application went in, I wrote a nomination letter, and lo and behold, I had 100 applicants, only 25 of whom got to a Founders Fellow, and George Labonte was one of the 25. Mr. Labonte. In part, it was him being able to know the people who were on the selection committee. Uh, the president and vice president at that time were both at our May conference, and we all met, and we went to dinner, and we sort of wined and dined them, and 
made them feel at home, and the word got around that they liked our, 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 our stuff. So I think it helped. But George Levante is an exceptional person. And the Rentham Police Department is um, fortunate to have a man of his caliber, and I am fortunate as a teacher to have had such a student in my class. And George is finishing up and is gathering data. So for those of us here from 501, there's a mentor you want to talk to. If you don't talk to me, go talk to him. Now, also as a result of having the, the uh, Public Service Week conference last May and having the executive director, who himself is from Rhode Island, um, and the president and the vice president of ASPA, the students, several of whom I've introduced here as board members of Rhode ASPA, formed their own panel. I, challenged them to do that in the fall, and they did. So impressive were they that the president of ASPA came up to several of them after and said, you should apply for the ASPA Founders Fellow Program. So they have. Um, well, the deadline is Saturday or Friday. I'm told that most of it's done, but they are finishing up that application. So um, it is not unknown, Mr. Labonte tells me, for one school to have more than one founder's fellow. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we get four. And um, if you wish, you can wish luck to Christopher Pierce, Sasha Depata, and um, Mickey Walters, and Chantel Beamer. I wasn't going to forget you. <laughs> um, so uh, we have another very important uh, ceremony this evening, and that is for Another outstanding student who has finished. Um, two years ago, we created the Dean's Outstanding Student Award in the MS in Leadership Program. And last year there was a tie, but this year there was only one student who we felt was deserving of the honor, and he is here with us tonight. Dr. Norville, do we have the, uh, we do. the uh, certificate? Not only is it suitable for framing, it actually is framing. <laughs> so you can hang it immediately on the wall. I don't, I don't recommend push tacks. Uh, I get those at my house a lot. If you use a sheet hot rock hanger, it'll work much better. This year's recipient of the Dean's Outstanding Leadership Student Award is Michael Munn. What, we're not good enough? I'm on video. So. Oh, 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 you're video. I thought yeah. you were video. Oh, here we are. Pardon me. Photos, so 2015. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> well, got the Starbucks camera coming up. <laughs> Can I just fun is say a movie theater. I'd like to say something uh, about my. So at the hooding ceremony last uh, last well, in May, mm -hmm. um, the provost recognized Mike as being the top transformational student. So the student who started the program with a particular intent in mind and finished the program being transformed as a um, as a result of the program but is in the process of transforming um, his organization as well. So those were the words that, that our provost, uh, Andrew Workman, had to say about Mike. And uh, we are very proud of him and would encourage all of you, either an MS uh, leadership program or MPA program, to, um, to uh, think about the values of Roger William and, and see how those values, transformation being one of them, can be incorporated into your schoolwork and into your professional work. Mm -hmm. uh, members of the board last February. Uh, I said members of the board last February met with me. Dr. Norville, I think you came a little bit later, but you were That's there. And because I wanted to plan this year's program theme. So we came up with a number of ideas, and Sasha Zapata took over the meeting. 
because she's a leader like that. And she said, innovation! And I said, that's a wonderful thing. So we all talked about it and we agreed. This year's thing would be innovation. So suddenly it was August. <laughs> and the fall reception and colloquium were on the schedule. And we had a theme, but we had no um, keynote speaker. So the call went out and Sasha Zapata answered. <laughs> And she said, I am the perfect person. And that perfect person is standing here with us this evening. Her name is Darlene Morris. It turns out that she went to Roger Williams University. I did. And has a bachelor's <laughs> degree uh, from Roger Williams University. She has an MBA uh, from Johnson & Wales. And she's the CIPP. She also is CIPP uh, certified. She is the director of the Center for Improvement Science at Rhode Island Quality Institute. She has also worked with our own Mrs. Walters, mm -hmm. uh, who vouches for her solid credentials and integrity. Uh, Ms. Morris has uh, 30 years of experience in healthcare, in performing roles in technology, quality improvement, and information privacy. She's also a working mother, mm -hmm. who has raised three children and done all of this. I study at her feet. <laughs> <laughs> I had three children, you can see what it did to me. <laughs> I digress. She currently leads the practice transformation program at the Rhode Island Quality Institute, which delivers quality, pardon me, delivers um, health information exchange services, and I believe that's one of the projects Ms. Zapata is currently working on. Um, Ms. Morris holds an MBA with a focus in organizational leadership, so our leadership students can also relate. As a BS in computer, computer information systems, as I mentioned, is a certified information privacy professional. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Darlene Moore. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. And you know, I realized how things have changed since I've been here. I graduated in 2007, and I understand now students can remote in to go to meeting. And if you're home, sick, you can listen to the class or you can listen to a recording. And um, we had excuses back then. We, we didn't have them. So, um, but anyway, I'm really delighted to be here. And I think that the Rhode Island Quality Institute is a, a perfect organization to talk to you about tonight with regard to innovation. So, Sasha, you can switch to the next. Great. So just a brief agenda. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the Institute, right? So I can set the stage, what our mission is, what our vision is, and what we do, uh, because that's, that's truly important. And then I'll, I'll define innovation, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how that happens at the Institute, okay? So you can get a sense of what we do. We truly are innovative. I'm going to prove that to you tonight. Um, and then show you some new products and services and how they came to be. So I have a lot of examples and graphics and things like that that I think will be interesting to all of you. Okay, so the Institute is a nonprofit so far. So we're coming up with all these great new products and services, which means what? We're starting to think about selling them now because that's what we do. <laughs> um, our mission is to significantly improve health and advance the quality and value of care. And what I want to call out here is health, right, and value, um, because those are very important, especially value when you're talking about innovation, when you're creating something new. It needs to bring value to your customers. Um, and health is a theme. We're a health IT company, um, so you'd think that we'd focus more on health I IT, you know, with the Health Information Exchange for the state of Rhode Island. So we're, we're the IT folks, right? But not really. We care ultimately about improving health of individuals in the state. Um, and our vision, and of course I highlight in red because every time I saw innovation in something of ours, I wanted to point that out. So our vision is of a vibrant, innovative, and connected community that engages the creative energy and commitment of all in the optimization of health. Once again, health, innovation, a connected community. Um, okay, Sasha. Um, and who we are. We're a center of collaborative innovation. So there's that word again. It just keeps coming up because this is what we do. Um, that advances health and care transformation. And we believe that all of us working together are better than any one of us acting alone. I just really like this statement. This statement goes out with our materials. 
Um, and just a, just one more um, word about working together. So we have gathered to, we're fortunate, Rhode Island's a small state, so we can get around the table uh, with all of the key players. And if you were to walk into one of our board meetings, and we attend them regularly every month, um, you'll find that the CEO of every single hospital in this state is sitting at that table and they show up every month. Um, as well as large organizations too. So we have so many key players. So it's all about bringing together those stakeholders. In other states where we found that this kind of thing that we do does not work well, it's when you don't have those key players around the table. You really need to do it together. Okay. So I'm, I have four slides. I want to talk to you about what we do there because it'll set the context. You really need to know what we do so I can show you how how we've come up with some of these products in truly innovative ways. So if you imagine that, pur that purple drum as a big database, and it holds patient data, right? And on the left, those are the data sources. So lab results are flowing in, prescriptions are flowing in, uh, x-ray reports, imaging reports, um, alerts from hospitals that say when you go to a hospital. So say you were admitted in a hospital on the weekend. An alert will immediately fly to your doctor from our system to say, you are there. So alerts flow in. And <coughs> in the back, there's another drop. It's kind of orange, and it says business services. And I'll talk about that more later. But try to imagine as the data's flowing in, right about here, there's something called the participation gateway. So we're an opt-in state. So that means individuals, you and me, have to agree to let our data flow into the database called Current Care. And then we have to agree for that data to be shared with our treating provider. So it's all HIPAA compliant and all that business. But the data hits the participation gateway and the system says, are they enrolled in Current Care? Yes, okay, put it in that pur purple drum. No, put it in the orange drum. So we separate data. It's really important because we're an opt-in state. Um, so what's in there right now? 90% of all the lab data in the state <coughs> sits into that one place. So I know some of you use portals, right? You use your own doctor's portal, and you can go in and get your lab results, maybe it's on your phone or what have you. Um, but what makes Current Care really unique is that we have data flowing in from everywhere. So we have all the hospitals sending us your data, wherever you go. So that's what makes it unique. 85% of all the pharmacy data in the state is in there. So that means your doctor ordered a prescription for you, we know about it. Did you fill it or not? We know about it. So we have all that in there. Um, all the hospitals, like I said, are feeding those admission and discharge notices when you go into a hospital or an emergency room. Um, and we've just processed millions and millions of transactions to date. You don't know how many of them we throw out, though, because if you're not enrolled in current care, they just, they won't hit the database. So again, we're an opt-in state. There's 1.2 million people in Rhode Island right now, and about half of them have agreed to share their data on current care. I mean, that, if you think about it, that's pretty amazing. How many of you have even heard of current care? Anybody? <laughs> Good. Excellent. Um, but, you know, we're a nonprofit, so one of the things we haven't done well, I think, is message it out. Like, you won't see us on billboards or on the sides of buses or anywhere else because we just don't have that kind of money to do that kind of thing. Uh, but it's coming. Uh, okay. Oh, is that the one? Yeah, that's the one right after it. Okay. Um, so, same slide, but I want to call your attention to the right side. So the data is flowing in, and now what do we do with it? So on the right side is the outputs, and I want to go over each one of these because later when I tell you about those innovations, you'll understand what I'm saying. The top one is current care and care management alerts. Again, those hospital alerts when you've been admitted or discharged are in there, and we send them out to your doctor. Current care viewer. It's an online portal. You go right on the Internet. You don't need an electronic health record and you, the, your doctor can view all the information about you. It's a portal. The provider directory, all we know about providers in the state. Where do they work? What health insurance uh, companies are they affiliated with? Um, all kinds of demographics on providers. Current Care for Me is a portal for you, and we just rolled this up. It's brand new. In fact, were you part of the pilot study, Sasha? I was not in the pilot. You weren't, okay. So it was part of the pilot study. And what was really cool about it was I had had an MRI about a month ago, and I uh, was waiting and waiting, and I was really anxious about the results. And I went into Current Care for Me, and there it was. Like, I got the results same day that they were finished. 
Um, and then dashboards are real-time view of patients who are in the hospital or ED. I'll show you a graphic of that. But just to give you a sense of uh, what the outputs are. So defining innovation, process of translating an idea into a service that creates value. So keywords, an idea, right? Translate it into a service that creates value. It has to satisfy a specific need. I really like this business dictionary definition because it resonated with a lot of what we're doing. I looked at several definitions, but this is the one I liked. Innovation involves deliberate application in deriving greater or different values from resources. So again, it's about the ideas, satisfying a need, using the resources you have and deriving greater value. And then there are two different categories, right? Evolutionary and revolutionary. Have, any, have you heard these terms before, anybody? Yeah. Great. So most of the innovations we do at the Institute are evolutionary. We have this technology, this health information exchange, this repository of data, and we keep making improvements, incremental changes to it to make it better and more valuable to the providers and people like you and I who use it. Um, revolutionary, those disruptive and new changes that come out, not so much those. Okay, so here's a story about hospital alerts. And I just want to say that our doctors are already beginning to find incredible value, and we're starting to gather really good stories about them. Um, I'll give you a quick example. There was a patient who was in a nursing home who had a fracture. And so they didn't know much about the patient. It was a new patient. They went in the nursing home for rehab. Um, and so they were going to treat the fracture. And they went into current care to look and found out the patient had cancer. The patient never mentioned it. So it completely changed that treatment for that patient immediately. So it's all about putting the right information in the right place at the right time so patients can get the best care. Okay, so hospital alerts, those are those messages. This is a sample of one. It's a test, so it's not nice and clear and sharp like a tricky. But this is a patient who was admitted to Westerly Hospital. And so it's an email message. It's basically an email message that says your patient's been admitted to the hospital. Yeah. Um, and why these are so great is because, so the doctor knows you've been admitted to the hospital. <coughs> if anyone, you don't have to raise your hand, but if anyone's a coastal patient and you go to Rhode Island ED, and they put that bracelet on you. The reason they're doing that is they, they want to identify you immediately because they don't want you to go in the hospital. Because they're trying to keep costs down. They're part of an ACO, or an accountable care organization. Um, and so the alerts let the doctor know where you are right away in real time so they can act quickly and get you help. We have another doctor who, as soon as he gets these alerts on his mobile phone, he'll text his patients and say, what are you doing in the ED? come to my office. So we're finding doctors use these in really creative ways. It strengthens the patient-provider relationship. We had an employee years ago who went to an ED and she was on her way home and the doctor called her on her cell phone. I understand you were in the ED. Is everything all right? She was just shocked and amazed that the doctor was right there. So, um, and of course reducing costly admissions. So. A little story about that is that since 2013, we've been collecting data on hospital admissions to get from the Department of Health. Because this is a big deal now in this new climate where they have to kind of keep the cost down on, on hospital admissions. And so we've been tracking it, and Sasha, the next slide will show that for patients whose providers receive these alerts, and that's the blue line, 30-day all-cause readmissions were 12% lower than for patients whose providers don't receive the alerts. So you just see it that in a very simple way how effective these alerts really are. And at the bottom it shows that we've already calculated if everybody was enrolled in current care and everybody was receiving these alerts, there'd be a $22 million reduction um, in the state in cost, in the hospital cost. So this is how, how valuable this is. But we had a big problem with these hospital alerts, right? So they're being adopted across the state. Practices are saying, yes, I need this. I need it right away. Everything was going great. And we thought we were on a roll. And then what happened? Something changed. The healthcare landscape changed. All of a sudden, doctors were moving into these accountable care organizations and these shared savings programs 
all of a sudden they were all concerned about utilization, like hospital admissions. And the total cost of a patient's care became really, really important. Um, so of course there was a greater need to reduce the admissions, but for all the patients, not just those in current care, so like I told you earlier, only half the population was in current care, so what does that mean? The doctor was only seeing half of the alerts. The other patients who weren't enrolled in current care, he had no clue where they were. So we met with this chief operating officer of a primary care practice, and he said, I, I cannot survive in this new climate. I can't afford the leakage. You've got to do something about it. So there was an idea. So we're moving along just fine, thinking everything was great. But somebody said, I can't afford this leakage. So someone challenged the status quo, right? That's important for innovation. Um, and so we took his idea and the need um, in our current technology, which was current care hospital alerts, and we created care management alerts and dashboards. So care management alerts through HIPAA agreements between the hospitals and the institute, and between the institute and the doctor's office. We put all those legal agreements in place, and now we're able to share alerts on all patients, not just those enrolled in current care. This is the coolest thing. So, so this is a dashboard, and nurse care managers use these. And these bars on the left here, the red bar is showing how many patients, this is real data of all current care enrolled patients. We just did a, a screenshot. 144 patients on this date were actually in the emergency room, and 504 were actually in the hospital on this date. On the right side, it shows discharges. Now, if you clicked on one of these bars, the next slide will show you exactly, I had to take the patient names out, of course, right? exactly who's in the hospital and why they're there and it shows you where they are and how many times they've been in the hospital in the last six months and how many times they've been in an ED in the last six months and you should have seen how shocked we were when we ran this for the first time. And at the top of the list, because you can sort and filter and all that good stuff, at the top of the list there's a patient who'd been in the ED 30 times in the last six months. And we're like, oh my Imagine if providers had this data at their fingertips, because maybe they knew, maybe they knew the patient was in the hospital, but a lot of times they don't. Um, so all of a sudden, the, you know, things begin to open up because of this one innovation. So we have other products. So we had Current Care Viewer, right? And Viewer was that online portal for doctors to go in and see your medical data and see your prescriptions and did you fill the prescription and all that business. Um, but it only had medical data, so that was a problem. Um, so somebody said, well, wouldn't it be really nice if we could integrate behavioral health and substance abuse data in with medical data, because we're not treating two people. We're treating one person who has all of these issues. So we again challenged the status quo, and we became the first statewide health information exchange in the nation to integrate behavioral and substance abuse data into the HIE. And in 2013, we received an excellence award for that work. Okay. Um, something else is that the viewer was only available on the internet. Remember I told you how they got to go out on the internet? You now, when you go to your doctor's office and they wheel that card over and they have the laptop and they're not looking at you anymore because they're doing this. <laughs> Imagine if he's doing this or she and they have to then go bring up the browser window and log into the internet, try to remember the password for current care viewer, and, and they said, look, you know what, our adoption rates were high, the utilization rates were low, they said we don't have time to go into a separate system, so we had a, a need, right? And someone said, someone had an idea, they said, what if it could all be in one place? So we created cross-document exchange, which sent that patient information directly into the doctor's electronic health record. And now it appears in this place, this happens to be Epic Care Everywhere, um, and it appears on the Documents tab, and it says the document source is current care, and they can open it up, and then all the information about you that we have in current care pops up, and they can simply click on what they want to integrate right into their record. So they might do a med rec, and they might say, well, this person's on 10 medications, and I'm aware of them, but current care says they're on 11, and I want to drag that 11th one over, and they click it and it becomes part of the record. So there's always these new ideas and these needs and we sit down and we come up with some of these ideas. And not one more. So patients could not access their data for years. 
and so we decided why can't we open up the portal to patients so we did and this is called current care for me and this is what you see it's a little different from the doctor screen which is busy and a little kind of complex but the patient screen is really simple and easy to use and not only can you get all that data I told you about but you can also <coughs> trying to see where it is this one click here and share your records so you can you can bring up a copy of your records you can print them you can send them somewhere um, so imagine if you were seeing a new doctor for the first time or you moved to a different state and you wanted to bring your record with you you could bring it with you you could bring it with you in a hard copy or you could email it securely of course um, and that kind of thing but now you have the data at your hands we're not, and I've used my own record that, that way too. It's pretty amazing. And this is just kind of some snapshots of current care for me lab results, allergies, immunizations. It includes a full Medline dictionary too. So if you have a condition and you don't know what you know what it's all about, you click on it and the dictionary opens up and you can get all kind of information. It's like a one-stop shop. Okay. So same graph as I gave you before. Um, and just to kind of summarize that, you know, we were an HIE that received federal seed money to create this, right? I think we got, um, I think it was $10 million just to get it started. And we started very simply with connecting to maybe one hospital and then two hospitals, and we just kept growing and growing over the years. And then we created all these products. Um, and when we discovered a need, I think what makes us truly innovative is that we are not afraid to fail. Um, and so this is really important. It's not enough to have those needs and to have current technology and to have ideas. That's great. You all could have that just sitting in this room, right? But it's really important to have a really fertile environment for that. So you have to have an environment where it's OK to make mistakes. And we have that environment. In fact, we used to have failure sessions. Remember where we would talk about our failures? It was kind of silly, but we did. <laughs> and um, it, it's, it's truly OK to throw things out. Um, you have to be open. You have to have open minds and be open to new ideas. So anybody in the company can come up with ideas, and they're listened to, believe me. Um, and you have to challenge the status quo. I mean, you can't just assume that things are going fine as they are. And finally, when you're being innovative, it's really, really important that you be agile. So when change happens, like the healthcare landscape was just happening before our eyes, we had to be quick to make changes. We couldn't just sit around and take a year to come up with something new. Not to say some of these products didn't take a year to develop. Anybody in software development knows that. <coughs> but we had to act quickly. We had to be agile. And what we're finding now is that competitors have started to creep into our space. And we're not used to that, right? We're, we're a nonprofit who just kind of, we had the market. This is what we do. Nobody else did what we did. And now we're finding these competitors creeping in. It's actually keeping us on our toes a little more. Um, it's an uncomfortable feeling, but it's also um, a good feeling because we're coming up with more and more of these products and services. Is that my last slide, Sasha? Yeah. Okay, so what questions could I answer for you about the company? Uh, is my charter care no little part of current care? So it's not. And a lot of people ask us that. So that's another portal where you can get your information. But keep in mind that what you're getting there is just all the information from charter care or all the information from Care New England or Lifespan. Um, and Epic does have a great product, really, um, and their Care Everywhere gives all the information from everyone using Epic. But there's still not all the information. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're attempting to do, is create everything in one place. It's not to replace those other products, but to give you another option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so okay. I have a little bit more. All right. Um, so how would we as consumers and end users get in contact with you to establish an account with current care? Or is that strictly the hospital because they're the key plan? So that's such a great question too. If you pick up one of those cards on your way out, you can take it home and sign up for current care. Okay. As soon as current care for me, that portal becomes available, 
um, it's, it's live, but to certain groups. We're about ready to launch it to everybody soon. We'll send you an email and let you know it's live, and then you can get access. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How do you keep it secure? Hackers. Oh, that's <laughs> We have a whole slide deck on that. <laughs> and, and we have a whole person who sits there and does nothing but make sure it's secure. So I can't talk the uh, IT talk the way he can, but I can just assure you that it is definitely secure. I mean, it has to be. Um, up until just a couple of years ago, um, Sasha and I and others, other staff members uh, dressed very formally in work, like um, all the men needed to wear suits and, you know, ties, and um, everybody dressed really well. And the reason I say that is because our CEO always said to us, we are the holders of the data in this state. It's an important job. It, it matters. We need to present ourselves and we need to think about ourselves as having that important job. And she kind of relaxed on the dress code just maybe a year ago, which benefited the guys a little bit more because they could take those darn ties off. Even even the IT folks had to wear. Even the IT folks had to wear. Ties. I'm looking at you. IT. And they were always getting caught in things while they were on the desk and everything else. So that went away. But that's a good, good question. Too. We have a, a risk uh, management person who takes care of nothing but that, and he's constantly auditing the system. Right? So you're not supposed to look yourself up if you are, say, a nurse in a doctor's office. You can go through current care for me when that's available, but you can't look yourself up in a doctor's office if you work there. And so he'll audit to make sure the same last names are not looked up by the people. You know, so Darlene Morris didn't look up Darlene Morris. And once you do, you get flagged on that, like, for, for sure. Can't look up family members. Like, we keep tabs on that. Yeah. Anything? Any questions? Yeah, Vicki. Um, so you had mentioned the information goes directly into Epic, and so I'm assuming it's only Epic that does that. And so I see a shift of everyone changing into Epic. So is that kind of system change that is happening from something like this? So I think those are two separate things. I think people are moving to Epic because it is a good product, um, and because like Lifespan recently adopted Epic, um, but. We actually have integrated with Epic, NextGen, and Athena. So it's more than one system. We're going with the willing. We're going with the vendors that want to work with us. And don't charge too much. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any um, relationship with free hospital care? Mm -hmm. the, re yeah, pre -ho the reason I'm asking is because the Department of Health, their EMS division, is going to web-based records and, and, and things like that. So there's a lot of patients that receive treatment in the field. Yeah. And it's <coughs> with Dr. Department of Health, and it's on their servers, and the care is documented, and it's there. It's maintained by the state, and I didn't know if you had a relationship with them, but that could be put into the record. So I remember a few years back, we had a whole list of every EMS company in the state, and we wanted to give this to them because we thought, who needs it more importantly than them right there in the ambulance? Um, but we ran into some snags um, around policy. Um, that we couldn't overcome at the time. We were able to give it to independents who were HIPAA compliant, but some of the state EMS run organizations couldn't meet the stringent HIPAA requirements that we insist upon for one reason or another. Um, I don't know the details, but they couldn't, they wouldn't sign our data use agreement. So we kind of left that. But it's resurfaced now, and we're actually about to go into a project, I think, next year with the state to connect the EMS folks <coughs> here. So it's coming. Yeah, this, those legal snags can take forever. It took three years to get the Department of Corrections to get access to this system. That's how long it took because of legal snags like that. See, because if you're at the Department of Corrections, the director of the Department of Corrections has the right to look at any patient information at any time, inmates at any time. And we wouldn't allow him to look, so we told him we can't have that. <laughs> but he since said, okay, he won't look. So we're that sense. Okay, anything else? I do. Okay, terrific. <laughs> uh, this isn't an off-the-shelf database, is it? No. <laughs> 
Well, partly, but it is customized. InterSystems Corporation is our base, our platform. But it is customized. Right? And it's a relational database. I believe so. Yes, it has to be with those two yes. barrels you were showing. That's we have some people in here who are taking currently health informatics. Oh, <coughs> And uh, I don't know about them, but I heard the mention of several possible new fields to put in your tables in the database we're using. <laughs> um, I also heard some very important things that some of our other students, I hope, heard as well as I did. Um, the issue of leadership, and if you're going to do stuff that's innovative, sometimes it doesn't work. Right. So you won't up to it. You don't punish people. That's you find out what went wrong. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you think we're not teaching you what to do that's done in the real world, there she is. It's not just Norvell and I. It's just not Hall and Norvell, no. That's good. Other questions for Ms. Morris? Okay. Carly? Thank you. We thank you for your time. Sure. We're lucky to have you here, and we've been blessed with having wonderful students. In fact, none more wonderful. Aww. Aww. <laughs> and, Appreciate it. And you know, we have a tradition here that we never let a guest come and just eat. Okay. So, in recognition, oh goodness, we'd like to have cool. you take this. And put it on your desk or home. I certainly will. That and uh, when you look at it, remember that you were here with us and how thankful we were to you. Thank you so much. You're very good. Incredible. One of my favorite comments. Um, we have one other thing. Where is it? Um, we thought it appropriate that since um, one of the board members did yeoman-like work to help put this event together, and without her we wouldn't have had this wonderful speaker tonight, and so in token of our appreciation, we'd like to offer this gift to Sasha Zapata for her wonderful help and And it has a double gift giving um, significance because um, she has a birthday coming up yeah. and she'll be 24. <laughs> <laughs> and we have birthday cookies baked by birthday? hand by our own Sarah Karn. If she wants to share them, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> I did make two dozen. <laughs> well, again, thank That's you funny. so much for coming. Um, I've been enriched by these this series of, uh, of presentations. Who are you pointing to? Dessert. Oh, oh well, just. <laughs> <laughs> her yeah, her party. Yeah, I was thinking we're coming and talking about being at risk, and I think we have again this evening. Now, uh, there are some further refreshments to take part, uh, partake of, take part, whatever. Um, so before you go, please to help yourself, and those of us in PA, LEAD 505, we will be meeting in room 2.30. 2.30 at 7.30 p.m. I will see you there. Enjoy the evening.